shit. What's cracking, big dogs? <laughs> Same. No respect. Zero respect. I'm feeling a few different firings happening tonight. <laughs> Both of y'all. I'm going to send Scott maybe a text. Hey, Dan fire Quinn. All y'all fire, fire him again. Oh, happy national Dan Quinn is dead today. <laughs> big, big day for the brand. Dan Quinn dead. We're bike. Bike in the headquarters. Bike with the bunk bed boys. Bunk bed breakdowns. Make sure you're following their YouTube channel. Make sure you are subscribed to them on the podcast. They got their own brand whole thing going on, right? Outside of just my YouTube channel. So make sure you are subscribed for the good shit. Five days a week videos. One, two, three, four, five. Y'all do weekend shit? No. I might start though with a uh, Patreon exclusive type of stuff. Yeah, I might start doing some uh, roster breakdowns on the weekend. I think Saturday um, in the off season, like you know how I do a Saturday live stream? I think we should do that. If you guys are available at like noon or 1 p.m. or whatever, we get on for an hour and just do like a, a three-person Q&A live stream. Yeah, three-person fetal. I like that. Yeah, we all get fetal. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking video will be uh, vertical so we can actually get in fetal position. It'll be perfect. All right. <laughs> We're here to talk about week five, recap everything that happened. We are filming this on Monday night. It is exactly halftime of the Chargers versus Saints game. It is 2010. We've got Justin Herbs and Spices, the absolute fucking goat right now. Three touchdown passes in the first half. Noah's over there. Noah's just waiting for the, the, the death of Herbert. He knows this is too good to be true. It's not going to last. <laughs> yeah, I have the game on my phone right now. I'm just waiting for my phone to die, so I don't have to see what happens. <laughs> They're going to blow this game. There's no doubt in my mind. Oh, hundred percent. Breeze, Breeze looks like a noodle on the fucking field right now. There's no Breeze. way it could be worse with James Winston. Breeze looks like Philip Rivers. If Breeze yeah. is a noodle, what does that make Taysom Hill? Dude, he's a different type of food. He's non-edible. <laughs> <laughs> Breeze is a fucking noodle. <laughs> well, you know, it would be electric if James Winston went out there. Like they bench Breeze and James Winston went out there and immediately threw a pick six. Like first <laughs> <fucking game. laughs> that's exactly what happened too. That'd be so good. Everyone would go absolutely nuts. All right, let's talk about some games. Let's talk about uh, – I don't really want to talk well, about Nick, the Falcons. Can we like talk about the intro first? <laughs> Mike, you want to kick it off? Who's going to break? <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to break. <laughs> A lot of stalemates going on tonight. Can't hit the intro twice. All right. I'll kick it off, man. I mean, look, it was another uh, – can I call it a brutal week? I'm going to call it a fucking brutal week because we lost We lost a big one. It's and, a brutal life, man. Everything and, is brutal. Yeah, honestly, I'm I'm emotionally distraught. I'm, waiting for this, I'm ready for this season to be over. Uh, I'm on to 2021. I'm on to 2022. Uh, I'm, I'm already past the season, guys, because we locked Dak, Dak Prescott. And for those of you – who play in single QB leagues probably doesn't matter, but if you play in a super flex or a double QB, uh, most likely Dak went in the first, second round. And he was literally letting it up. It's on pace for like fucking six thousand yards. Uh, that's not even an exaggeration. I think he was literally on pace for like fifty seven hundred. That was like yards. literally an understatement. He was on pace <laughs> was for almost seven thousand yards. Yeah, for real. Dude, he he was going absolutely ham. He was carrying C D Lamb. He was carrying Amari Cooper. Uh, they were carrying him. It was just a great, beautiful thing to watch. Uh, their defense still fucking stinks, um, and their team stunk, but it was good for fantasy. So losing Dak, uh, I mean, I, I, hon I honestly thought that his shoe fell off when I was looking at it at first, and it turned out his ankle basically snapped, and his foot was pointing towards Mars. If you are if you have a faint, a faint stomach or uh, you can't handle that shit, I'd highly recommend you looking that up. Um, I thought the foot came out too. It looked like it, his heel was outside yeah. of the thing, like it just slipped off or something. Yeah. And then you realize like his foot was <laughs> yeah. like doing the stanky leg all the way <laughs> to the right side. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. And then as soon as he waved over, you knew that shit was, yeah. was over for Dak. So that, that was like one of the more uh, like brutal, just like pure emotional, like yeah. sports moments I feel like we've had in a while. You don't have injuries like that, especially to a player like Dak who was so – you know, valuable to the team. And, like, the entire team depends on Dak to have this thing running. So, that, that was bad. But, like, I guess the way I'm looking at it now, obviously, if you're in a super flex league, that, that's a, a massive hit to you. If you can get Dalton, you know, waivers probably already ran by the time you all are watching this. So, hopefully, you're able to get him. What do you guys think this means for the receiver? Like, I, this is going to change things for the receivers going forward, and especially for, like, Dynasty. You know, we had gotten really, really, really high on, um, on CeeDee Lamb 
you know, last week we were talking about how he's untradeable. And this is not really going to change his, like, dynasty outlook, but it does change the near future. And Dalton's not going to be able to operate this offense as smoothly as Dak Prescott would have been. Um, now, does C.D. Lamb, you know, maybe he was up at, like, your wide receiver two or three or four in dynasty. Does this drop him down maybe below a guy like Devontae Adams or Tyree Kill or, uh, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, who – is not going to have as much longevity, but will produce for you this year at a level that CD probably won't anymore. He's uh, he, he was like, Tyreek was already ahead of CD for me. Like that was one of the only guys that I was considering. Like I would definitely take him over CD if that offered to me. Um, CD is like my wide receiver seven. So it's not like he's my wide receiver two. I still got like DK, uh, but like he's in that tier where it's like, I'm just not trading him for another guy in that tier. And similarly, I'm not trading another guy, another guy in that tier for him. Like if I have DK, and someone offers me CD, I'll be like, no. And if someone offers me DK for CD and I have CD, I'll be like, no. So it doesn't really move much for Dynasty. I actually think he'll be fine uh, for for even seasonal with, with Andy Dalton. I think Dalton's like a serviceable quarterback. Like he's not going to beat anyone uh, if it goes off schedule. You know, if you see him start rolling, you will get ready for that fucking interception incoming. But if he's like in the pocket and it's clean, uh, I think he's, he's best actually going to be pretty best good. Best case scenario, if you had to rely on like the Dallas weapons and vice yeah. versa, like – you know, we know what Dalton is at this point, and like yeah. their supporting cast is so strong that they can pretty yeah. much, you know, yeah. a, a rising fucking tide. Yeah, this is like the. I mean, this is probably one of the best O lines he ever played behind, even though they lost Tyron. This is probably one of the best receiving cores that he's ever played with, and I think I think he's gonna rely on CD, right? Because CD is gonna be running from the slot. I think this fucks over Michael Gallup, uh, if if anything. I think those those deep because they've been content leaving him on an island, just rocking it, you know, one on one on the outside, and giving, he literally just runs the seam every single play. Yeah. Yeah, they just give Amari and CD all the all the good targets, uh, and you know Dalton's not going to be hitting him in stride down the field anytime soon. So I think it hit, it really hurts him. But I think you know Cooper probably not going to be on pace for 200 targets anymore. But uh, I think you know Cooper and CD can still really be like that you know low end wide receiver one, high end wide receiver two. So I'm not too worried about them. Mike, you didn't run your oh. tests on the target market share when Andy Dalton came in under center, as the guy asked you to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no I, just, I was like, no. I love guys, that. So, yeah, some guy on Twitter, like, dude, these guys have balls. They're just like, they came in, I, I tweeted something about, like, CeeDee Lamb. He's like, um, can you please tell me what the exact target market share was uh, for all the Dallas wide receivers after Andy Dalton come in and make sure you tag me? Thanks. They just know, I have no idea, like, <laughs> where the stats come from. Every time you tweet out a stat about an individual, you get, like, five requests for three other individuals. You do, like, a top five list, and they're like, what about these six guys? Where do they rank? I'm like, bitch, I don't, go use Google or something. I told you, Mike, you should have been like, this guy had 38%. This guy had 47 This one had 53 He's like, that doesn't add up to 100 well, You asked me to do the math. I didn't say I was good at this. No, but I agree with you. C.D. Lamb definitely has the easiest job out there because, obviously, he's a good receiver, and he's playing out of the slot. And as you said, the offensive line we think is good, but it's really not that great. The running game hasn't really picked up all that much. I still think that they're going to be throwing the ball a lot, especially with their defense. How many points did they let up to the Giants? I know they had like a pick six, but wasn't it like 30-something? Like this team is bad. They're going to be throwing no matter who they play against. And I think CeeDee Lamb's going to be fine. Uh, Amari Cooper I'd much rather have than Michael Gallup. That just goes without saying. But Michael Gallup is basically double covered on every route he runs because they put one cornerback on him, and then he has a sideline also against him. So – uh, he's definitely not somebody that I'm looking to buy low just because he had like those two deep catches at the end of the game. They were just kind of force fed to him because they had to move the ball field uh, to eventually win that game. So uh, as, it, as it stands right now, it definitely hurts everybody overall just because it was an unsustainable pace that they were on. But CeeDee Lamb, as Mike was saying, he's still like a top six or seven dynasty receiver for me. I would definitely rather have DK Metcalf than him just because he's also extremely young and he's paired to Russell Wilson and we don't really know how long this Dak injury is going to last or if the Cowboys want to make him their long-term starter, which I hope they do because he's fucking great. Um, but, yeah, for Dynasty, it doesn't really move him too much. In seasonal, I still view him as, like, a middling wide receiver, too, and Amari Cooper on the wide receiver one borderline. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I, I think most of it won't be lost with CD. Just, I mean, he's running from the slot legit, like, 94 to 95% of his routes this year, which is, which is pretty crazy. I'd like to see him go outside a little bit and see what they could do, you know, down the field. Uh, maybe in like a Gallup role for like half a game, see if they take some shots down there. But we've had, a, we've had a few like quarterback injuries this week in a sense. We had, I don't know what Ron Rivera was doing, keeping Alex Smith out there to get absolutely sacked and get his leg broken off. But that that wasn't, this was, this was just like a crazy week of football here between Dak and then you have Kyle Allen, get the start, get hurt, 
Alex Smith runs on the field and like we coll- I feel like everybody collectively was like, oh fuck. Like we all like, <laughs> is, like do held you think our Aaron breath. Donald was afraid to like go out there and be like, I can't do this. Like I don't want to do this to this man. Did I it saw look it like he was like. afraid? Did you see the first <laughs> fucking, fucking sack? No, but like man. you have to feel bad after a while. You like you can't just keep okay. doing that. Um, I guess you can. Um, when, when your contract is fucking nine figures, you you can absolutely yeah. fucking do whatever you want. That's why yeah, I'm not in the I NFL. Mean, I don't have that mentality. You that, get that, taken out in a second. That whole <laughs> offense is 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 kind of it's kind of in the shitter. I mean, I didn't it didn't look great with Kyle Allen to begin with, but then Kyle Allen got injured, and then Alex Smith came in, which is a great great story for Alex Smith, obviously. But you know that offense, he was they so put up, they put up how, they put up how many yards in the second half? Like like negative six, something like that. That's not an exaggeration. They put up like no they put up like no yards. I Probably think his yards per attempt. Times. Yeah, I think his yards per attempt number was legit like one point seven or something insane like that. I'm like. What are we doing with Terry now? Because that this makes me nervous. Dwayne Haskins yeah. like somehow seems to be the best case scenario because at least he'll chuck the ball downfield. At least he'll rack up like 270, 300 yards on whatever, like just because they're in comeback mode. But Kyle Allen and Alex Smith are just not throwing the ball downfield, which I don't know. It, it's a big it's a big hit for Terry. I'm gonna hold I'm not gonna go nuts over a one game fucking sample size, obviously, but this is uh this could be a problem. I also think it's yeah. important to note, like, this was Terry's floor game, and he still saw seven targets despite playing with a brand-new quarterback and then another brand-new quarterback who couldn't walk for, like, basically two years. And they also played a really good pass rush, and he saw Jalen Ramsey all game. Their upcoming schedule, the Giants, the Cowboys, the Giants, the Lions, the Bengals, Dallas, all in a row. So it's definitely going to ease up a little bit. It's going to be pretty uh, soft schedule out there, and he's going he's gonna to see double-digit targets, whether that turns into production – I don't really know because Kyle Allen stinks, but he's also really good after the so, catch. I mean, like, he might, just, he might just turn into Logan Thomas. Like, he, I know it's your fucking boy, the volume <laughs> Dude, Logan god. Thomas you know, like, stinks. that's <laughs> the problem with, like, <laughs> Terry's floor with Haskins was, like, a nice four for 70 game or whatever. Now, you know, his floor with, with Kyle Allen is, like, four for seven. You know, you yeah. take out the fucking zero and it's ugly. Yeah, I mean, I, I could not believe it, like, the whole entire week on Twitter, I had to like fight off all these people telling me how oh, Kyle Allen's gonna be an upgrade for Terry. I'm like, dude, Terry was fucking he was a wide receiver ten with with Dwayne Haskins at the helm. How do you, how do you expect Kyle Allen to come on? And it, it made no sense. I mean, and Alex Smith is obviously hurt. It's probably too early, uh, but I'm definitely concerned in season in season long. I'm I'm definitely concerned in dynasty. I'm less concerned, but uh, but probably still concerned. So, you know, be on the lookout for that. Um, you know, on the other side of the ball. Uh, Darrell Henderson, you know, the week that everyone probably benched him, uh, came out and put on a monster week with some touchdowns. Didn't get much on the yardage side. Uh, but Cam Maker sighting, you know, went out there, rushed 43 yards, which is uh, almost <laughs> as much as Zach Moss has the entire season, as Nick correctly pointed out. Uh, Zach Moss is 48 yards on the season. Uh, Cam Maker's got that in one run. So, you know, take from that what you will uh, from the preseason takes. But, you know, it, it's it's good to see. But in season all, in season long, like I'm, you're still concerned, right? This is a fucking shit show at running back. You're you have no idea who you're gonna start uh, going forward, and it's just gonna be pretty brutal. You're gonna be running back for committee. Is he is Cam Akers droppable for you guys in season all? I think this whole I mean, if, offense is just like fucked up. Like I don't know to tell people to start Cooper Cup or Robert Woods or any of the running backs <laughs> or Gerald Everett or Tyler Higby. Like people tweet at me, would you start Cup or Woods this week? I'm like just pick somebody up off the waivers because I don't want to be liable for whatever happens. <laughs> I just don't know who to start. Yeah, it's it's really tough. I think um, I think if you held Acres up to this point, like this last week's performance, I feel like you need to hold on for one more week. After like Henderson having a good game, Acres breaking off the big run, you you'd have to think they start phasing Malcolm Brown completely out. I think Cam Acres, like with his size, gives you more than enough to take Malcolm Brown out of the game plan, give Acres that work, and then if they're splitting the back, if they're splitting the work 50-50, like a good game script for the Rams against like weaker opponents. I think both of them can be used as, as flex plays. You're not going to feel good about it. I actually, I had to start Darrell Henderson in one of my leagues out of like necessity because the rest of my team was so fucking bad, which that felt good. But like, I'm, I don't know if I'll ever be able to start him again. So there is a problem there, but like if you held on to him for this long, I feel like waiting another week or two is probably the move because these committees change fast, man, especially with talented players in them. Also, does it look yeah. like Daryl Henderson gained a lot of weight to you guys? It seems like him and Ronald Jones have the same exact career arc. They like, like sucked as rookies <laughs> and they gained weight, and they're like, okay, we'll start you now because you're kind of big. Daryl Henderson's head always looked like weirdly fucking big to me. Every time he's out there, it looks like he's got the big head cheat code on from uh, <laughs> from NBA jams. His like body, his body was always small. He came in as like a 205 pound back. And his head is like 245 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> fucking weird. Um, all right, well, 
Uh, we're not going to cover every game, but I think there's a couple of more interesting ones that uh, I definitely want to go through. Um, we'll quickly gloss over the ravens Bengals game because, I mean, Joe Burrow looked mortal for the first time to me. At I'll least tell you one season. thing. I'll always remember when the What's Poppin' uh, remix came out because when he said, I'm in the pocket like Burrow, I have like to Burrow. know it wasn't during the 2020 season because if he knew this was <laughs> what the pocket was going to look like, he would not put that in that verse. <laughs> there was no pocket. Uh, but he did escape, man. Joe Burrow is elusive. Uh, more elusive than Joshua Kelly. We know that for a fact. But pretty elusive. Pretty elusive in his own right. I mean, there were a couple pl- times where he like he would drop back and there would already be four guys in his face. And somehow he like slip, slip up, like climb up in the pocket and run for like positive four or five yards. So, at, you, you know, you like to see that. Here, here's an interesting question, though. Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert? Who you guys got uh, in Dynasty going forward? Burrow. Yeah, I'm, I'm still going Burrow. They're going to say rest of the season. Rest of the season, I'm going to rock with Herbert. But I think Burrow is just – yeah, he's shown so much. I just don't like the fact that Cincinnati has to play Baltimore again and Pittsburgh a few times. Yeah, that that's I'm, – I'm with you there. I think season long, you got to go with uh, Justin Herbert. But I think the way, uh, you know, we'll, we'll think about it, and I was on uh, I was on Jax Falcone's uh, pod yesterday, and, and, you know, he put it in a nice way too, and I, I tend to agree with him. I think I would take the – the profit that you can get from trading Burrow for Herbert plus, you know, if you can get Herbert plus a first, you know, Herbert plus, you know, a couple other pieces, Herbert plus like a wide receiver. Like I think those are all doable deals just because of like the hype that Burrow had coming in. And this is his first disappointing game. So, you know, don't try and sell after this game, but you know, halfway through the season, I think you can try and get a deal like that done. And I'd be, I'd be pretty open to it. Yeah. Burrow just feels like one of those pieces in dynasty that like, very few and far between that you kind of want to build your team around. For me, yeah. he's a piece that I just don't really want. It's not, it's not so much winning a trade in value or anything. It's just like, you know, you have your one super flex spot like set up and then you can have like a couple of mediocre quarterback twos and threes around there that you can like work around borrow for the future. So he's just not, not a guy I'm necessarily looking to, to move. But in that game, I know we, uh, we had a lot of talk about Joe Mixon. Now Mixon had a funky game. I mean, yeah. he had his like his typical two two point four two point six yards per carry, whatever he had. Shitload of volume though, twenty four carries, fifty nine yards. Got really involved in the passing game this time around, and we're Eight seeing targets. G- yeah, we're seeing Geo's touches go down drastically. I just like I I I, I guess Mixon might be in the same boat as Burrow, where like are they good enough to overcome? Th- this could be a, just a problem all all season long. You know, mm-hmm. maybe not dynasty looking, but for season long the situation is just not good enough for them to overcome tough opponents. Like, yeah, he did it against Jacksonville, but they play Indy now next week and that could be an issue. And, uh, you know, that, that's my concern going forward. It seems like the passing game is starting to move in favor of Mixon and Geo's playing less, less uh, snaps, running less routes and everything. But what, what are you thinking about Mixon after this game? I think it's good yeah. that we saw that much work out of him in two very different game scripts. Like this past week, they got blown out. The week before, they blew the other team out and he saw 63 opportunities across those two games. But I agree with you. Like, against Indianapolis, it's going to be tough running. Kareem Hunt struggled against them, so I'm not sure that he's going to do much better. Um, and I just don't – I don't know. He, he reminds me too much of Leonard Fournette of last year, where it's just, like, a lot of volume, but most of it's just, like, empty volume. He's not going to really be in too many scoring positions. And the team just wants to air the ball out, and I'm not sure that that's going to really uh, lend itself to him becoming, like, a top five, top six running back in fantasy, even though he's getting the volume of one. Yeah, top five, top six out of the question. That, that's kind of gone. Um, so that ship has failed. But – but what I will say is they are starting to get him more involved in the passing game early on, right? So they're still pulling him up. They're still pulling for for uh, Geo in some of the like late uh, two minute drills and stuff for God knows why. Uh, but early on, like they're starting to look to him on like first down, you know, on second down, uh, get a couple of those targets. Obviously, it didn't work out this game because you know Ravens fucking stomped them into the ground. But that is encouraging for me. Uh, at least from a dynasty perspective. So I'm not saying I'm going to go out and buy Joe Mixon, but, you know, 30 touches, empty touches as they may be, that that stuff's just not really available uh, too often. And they have a pretty tough schedule, like you said, Noah. So for season long, I'm I'm definitely very concerned. But for dynasty, this is like, you know, a glimpse into, you know, what could happen if they continue to improve on that offense side of the ball. So like you kind of see the usage two weeks back to back, uh, on, on the receiving side. So I think it's a bit of a positive. It's the only silver lining because he obviously didn't do anything for you uh, from a fantasy perspective, but I, I like kind of like what I saw there. Yeah. We w- within Higgins. that game. Yeah. I was about to say within that game, this was just like a big week overall for rookie wide receivers, man. Like at this point, there's, there's not any rookie wide receivers that are disappointing outside of just like pure injuries. Like Denzel Mims. We had the, the monster game from Chase Claypool. We had T Higgins within the same game. Um, it's now starting to take over as 
at least the alpha from like a volume or opportunity perspective. Mm-hmm. AJ Green went, went down with the hammy injury. We have LaVisca Chenault doing his thing. Obviously, CeeDee Lamb doing his thing. Henry Ruggs even had his big game. Two fucking catches for 118 yards. Most efficient game of all time, possibly, yeah. from a wide receiver. <laughs> so, at this point, it's like Claypool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said that, but thank you for reiterating. <laughs> his game was good enough that we probably yeah, should. I think you got to say it twice. Yeah, he, he, he should have like five touchdowns. touchdowns. He should have five touchdowns. So, so, let me ask you, going forward, um, you know, we'll put, like, Jefferson, CD, probably in their own tier. Um, say like you're picking up one of these dudes on waivers or like you're targeting one of them. Let's go for season long because dynasty will, it'd be a whole nother fucking conversation, but between Claypool, Higgins, uh, rugs and LaVisca, I'm assuming Higgins is going to be Higgins and LaVisca are probably going to be one and two there. Right. Like, I, yeah. I don't know if I trust Claypool enough, like a week over week thing. It could be like a Deontay Johnson got hurt and pushed him into more of a role because James Washington is still running more routes and Juju's obviously still there. So I think from a pure opportunity standpoint, like I might even go Higgins over LaVisca because with AJ Green out, like Higgins actually has a path to the the real wide receiver one on the outside there. Whereas like Visca is not going to be that guy as long as DJ Chark is, is there. And DJ Chark busted his ankle a little bit too. So him and, yep. him and Green could be in similar situations. What are you guys thinking about these rookie wide receivers? First of all, I love all of them, um, yeah. you know, and just want to remind you guys, you guys kept disrespecting Titty Higgins all off season. Now he's just dunking on both of you. So I just, first of all, love to see that uh, a lot. He, power he, the has, he hasn't done shit yet. Just to see him prosper. Love to see it. He hasn't, to he it. hasn't accomplished shit yet. He's yeah, just he, on the field. I love lot. it. I love it. Um, but no, sell, realistically sell, speaking, sell, sell, sell. <laughs> realistically speaking, I think I still prefer LaVisca. He was my pick before the season for season long league because you're seeing like the rushing opportunity. He got a goal line carry uh, this week. It didn't convert because they got fucked. Um, they had some horrible, horrible red zone calls this week, but he's getting opportunity on the ground. He's basically leading in targets. And I actually think he's more like one B to one A of DJ truck. DJ truck is still that outside premier threat. Right. But from a fantasy perspective, LaVisca is getting like some of those pretty juicy targets. He's making, he's making Gardner Minshew look a lot better than Minshew is. Cause he, Minshew threw some fucking like terrible balls and LaVisca like extended to like really grab him and pluck him out of the air. So I really like LaVisca going forward and he's been usable pretty much every week. And he's seen the volume, he's seen the snaps, the peripherals are there. Uh, he's not going to go out and get you like 30 points, but you know, he can get you double digit points every week uh, pretty much. Yeah, the only thing that worries me about LaVisca Chenault is the one game we expected him to blow up in was the game that Chark missed. And against Miami, that offense just could not move the ball. I'm not so sure if it was yeah. Miami's defense being good on a short week on a Thursday night or they just their offense isn't the same without DJ Chark stretching the field and they don't have that element of their offense uh, that really helps out LaVisca Chenault underneath. For me, I'd probably go T. Higgins just because it seems like A.J. Green is dust. Uh, he's getting deep targets. He's getting targets in the red zone. And he's just getting overall volume on an offense that wants to throw the ball a ton. I know Jacksonville does too. It's really splitting hairs and it takes a lot out of me to choose Titty Higgins over a guy like LaVisca Chenault, who we made that video about, but uh, I'll slightly lean Higgins uh, and then I'll go LaVisca. And then it's probably just like a toss up with the other three. Cause like what Nick said, I think Claypool, the role that he carved out was simply because Deontay Johnson missed time. Although he does like deserve more work going forward. If Deontay Johnson's healthy, he's not going to be seeing 11 targets and four touchdowns a week. Yeah. The peripherals aren't there yet for Claypool. Yeah. So um, Do you guys know that? Just one quick side note. You guys know that yeah. account that's like Ken Zacherts break the tackle, and the guy just keeps tweeting no. I, yeah, I think we've got. I think we got to make one of those for Joshua Kelly because this guy, is, <laughs> this guy just not. He really, anything. he really like made us believe. Who they got in now? Is that fucking Brandon Oliver from six years ago? <laughs> oh no, is it? The only thing I remember. No way they re- scores Achilles trying to block somebody. I don't Who know. Who is that? Who's number thirty-five? The running back. I don't know. Is that that dude Cox curious. that like everybody was hyped up about because he's two forty and runs a four four? Tremaine Pope. <laughs> Tremaine Pope. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say the no. Charges. The one from the the one from the Hard Knocks. That dude was thick as hell. I feel like he got cut. No. Probably. I don't. I don't. I don't know much about this team to be honest. Other than I feel, like you, I feel like you just went into the year like thinking that you were fucking doomed, so you just didn't. You had no fandom going. Yeah, towards I just like followed Tyrod on Instagram. I saw he had some type of swagger. I'm like, I guess this will work. And then he's <laughs> like fucking stabbed. So it's more. Right, let's move on. Next game. Next game. We're gonna cover this r- real quick because Nick Nick hates them, but it's it's the Falcons. It's the Falcons versus Panthers. Uh, not much to say on the Falcons side other than Todd Gurley looking like his old self. You love to see that. Um, no, he looked like his against old the, self. Did you see how he got in the end zone? He had like a cane out yeah. there limping, and he, like the defense. No, no, no that's what bro. I mean. 
Bro, yeah, I was, I was going to say stop that. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like like he's producing like his old self. But again, it's against the the league's worst rushing defense, and they still fucking took that L. This team this team stinks. Uh, so that was the lone bright spot there. Calvin really continues to ball out. Actually, Calvin really is just a baller. Uh, he's he's get he's a volume target hog right now. So if you have him, just slot him in every, every single week. I know he gave you that goose egg, but just ignore that. But I think the more interesting conversation on the other side, you know, DJ Moore took that slant. And took it to the house, and everyone was hyped. I was hyped. And then as the game progressed on, I think Rob Robbie Anderson just continues to cement himself as the wide receiver one in this offense, uh, in this, you know, Matt Rule, Temple, converted offense. You know, Teddy Bridgewater loves him. He's getting the underneath stuff. He's he's getting some deep looks as well. Uh, is, is Robbie Anderson, you know, the wide receiver one in both from a redraft? And I think redraft, obviously, he is. But from a dynasty perspective, like, should we be looking at him as as one of the one of the top end guys? He he's, he went disrespected all off season. Yeah, I, th- I think at this point he's got to be like borderline. I don't know how high to go with Robbie Anderson. I feel like he's one of those guys that you just should keep moving up, but you get to a point where he's like, ah, I don't know if I can like put Devontae him. Like Parker but- of last year too, the Adam Gase effect. It's like, oh, you got burned by him so many times. But if you take away the name Robbie Anderson, you just look at the numbers he's putting up. It's like, this is a legitimate wide receiver one. It's like basically Julio Jones because he's not scoring touchdowns. He's putting up 100 yards a week. Yeah. I mean, Although, he, he is 27 and a half, so he's a little bit on the older side here. And that's 30, the only thing right. that, like, <laughs> dynasty, I'm not going to put him above DJ Moore. I just, I don't know. There's just, we, we have enough sample size of DJ Moore to know that he is actually good. And I think eventually he'll find his way into this offense. But, like, there's a real legit conversation to be had for Robbie Anderson, you know, in, inside the top 20 wide receivers in dynasty, I think. Would you rather have yeah. him or Robbie, or uh, not Robbie Anderson, uh, Robert Woods? I, I was literally just about to say, like, I'm moving him into that group of guys. Like, yeah. the, I have that tier of, like, you know, Devontae Parker, Robert Woods, you know, Tyler Lockett to a degree. Like, he's kind of moving into that, that group because of, you know, he still has multiple good years left. Uh, but he's producing at an elite level in an offense that's passing a lot. So I'll take I'll rad. take Anderson there, man. I think I've seen enough this year to f- to feel like really confident about Anderson's role in the offense and and just like the upside of this offense. I think probably um, can keep kind of soaring, especially like first for we're in the first four or five games of Joe Brady's offense and they're putting up points. Robbie Anderson is fucking playing that role beautifully. So yeah, I've seen enough, and I, I think he's he definitely belongs in there. I, honestly. That's such a tough one. I, I think I might, I'd probably still stick with Woods. He got the extension, and I feel a little bit more comfortable with the situation they have over there. But the fact that we even need to like debate this is pretty telling. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I think for this season also, like we're worried maybe about Christian McCaffrey coming back, and that hurts him. But like Mike Davis is on pace for like 300 catches this year. I don't think that really matters all too much. If you look at their schedule, they don't have a buy until week 13. It's, he's going to help you out for a long-ass stretch because over that time before they get their bye, they play New Orleans, Atlanta, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, Detroit, Minnesota, either bad defenses or games where they're going to have to keep throwing, and they throw no matter who they play against anyways. He's put up 99 yards or more in every single game except one where they played the Chargers. So uh, he's to me, he's like a legit high-end wide receiver two, wide receiver one on that borderline uh, for redraft leagues just because he is seeing double-digit targets a game almost. And he's being used in every quadrant of the field. And he's really shown that he can be a yards after catch type of receiver, not just a deep threat like Adam Gase is trying to use him as. We had another interesting breakout where, you know, we have two teammates that were getting drafted similar, um, similar ADPs, unlike Anderson and DJ Moore, but Cooks and Fuller, man. Fuller keeps doing his thing. So Fuller is like a legit high-end wide receiver too. And I think you could probably argue him into like, that top 12-ish range because he's been so consistent when he's not. You know, if he goes into the game on the injury report of the hamstring, you know, just don't play him. But if he's going into the game. He blew up that week that he had a hamstring injury. I paid for it. Which week? The the week before this week. Like, he showed up with a hamstring. I'm like, all right, I'm Benjamin Fuller. And then he went out and had, like, 100 yards in the tutty. Oh, I play. I, I feel like they took him off the injury report right before, though. Maybe I'm Yeah, no, they, they did. They did. But he was, like, on the in, injury report for hamstring the entire week. And I was like, fuck that. Learn the fucking rule. Learn the fuller rules here. But Brandon Cooks goes eight for one sixty one in a tug. Beautiful. Um, what do we? Mi- I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything to make of this other than one, like you can't hold Deshaun Watson down forever, and two, it's the Jaguars again. Like, can can that be like the end of the debate? But are we like Brandon Cooks? I don't think got a catch in the week before, and so now he yeah, goes eight I- for one sixty one in a touchdown. Um, I'm not really in a in a spot where I think I'm comfortable starting Brandon Cooks until we see this like consistently or at least like a three out of four kind of week sample size. But 
um, it, it, it looked good out on the field. He looked super involved and uh, Fuller, Fuller looked good too. So it was good to see both of them equally be able to get theirs. Yeah. Look, I mean, they get the Titans next week. Malcolm, uh, Malcolm fucking stinks. So, you know, someone's going to eat Fuller might eat, you know, Brandon cooks might eat. Uh, they get Packers after that. They get Jaguars again after that. So it'll be a, be a good stretch, a good test for Brandon cooks. But I think the, the most telling thing here is like, look, the first game Bob leaves positive things already happening. So, uh, you know, whether it's play calling, you know, whether it's Watson just getting that new, new injection of energy. I mean, we, we always knew Watson was a top end quarterback. At least I believed it. And he got an easy matchup this week. So it's going to be interesting to see how he plays out going forward. But I think this is good, man. This is good because we know Brandon Cooks is good too, right? Like he's not, he's not a scrub. Like, although when he took that fucking massive hit to the head, I thought he was done uh, for the for same. The, I was like, good, good night. RIP. Yeah, I career. thought he was dead, but then he came out and, and balled out. So look, for those of you that kind of like, you know, jumped off the bus on, on Watson. I think this gives you some hope to get back on board, but I agree with you. You can't really, really trust, you know, Brandon cooks yet. Uh, at least, you know, with Will Fuller there as the top dog. Yeah. And he's been playing like 90% of the snaps either way every week. And he hasn't really done much. I think week two or three, he had like 95 yards and we thought he was back. And then I wrote him up in the waiver wire article. He shit all over me because he didn't do anything until this week where nobody was starting him. So uh, it's just tough to trust any tight or Texans wide receiver outside of Will Fuller when Will, Will Fuller is healthy because he's by far and away their wide receiver one. He's being used deep down the field. He's being used in the red zone. Uh, Darren Fells did his best Darren Fells impression scoring a touchdown, but it wasn't a one-yard score, so that was good to see out of him. And David Johnson had, like, the second most rushing yards on the day, so I guess he's back again. Yeah, yep. that, shit, that shit was personally tweeted out. David Johnson and Todd Gurley both – both popping off every time yes. every time they run for more than like 10 yards it feels like we're getting stabbed a little bit in the <laughs> and I'm, I'm expecting my tweet my mentions to just blow the fuck up on it so uh yeah i mean obviously both 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 guys need to be owned brandon cooks if he was dropped in your league then go pick him back up and see what happens with a bill o'brien list uh houston texans team yep uh let's talk about upsets man there were a couple of big big upsets this week and the first one we'll talk about is probably a little bit less interesting, but the Dolphins fucking stomped the 49ers. And, and look, we know the 49ers are riddled with injuries, but Jimmy G looking like, I don't know what he's looking like. He looked like another, like an, like a Phillip Rivers 10 years from now is what he looked like, to be honest. Uh, he was just throwing ducks and just some bad, bad interceptions. I mean, he was, hit, he was hitting, he was hitting dudes in stride. It just happened to be defenders. So not what you <laughs> want to see from that offense. And, you know, we freed him up and they benched him for CJ Beathard or Beathard, however you fuck say his name. I call him Beathard because I think it's funnier. Um, uh-huh. Who la- last week, uh, you know, funneled, funneled targets to George Kittle. But uh, this week they just didn't get Kittle involved much. Uh, it was kind of embarrassing. Like, would you guys think it was a fluke? Like, you know, Fitz Magic went out there and fucking balled out, you know, bald game for uh, Preston Williams. Finally had the smash spot. Devontae Parker continues to be a value. Uh, you know, people still hated on him all offseason, but he's proven to be, you know, the lead dog there. So they got some weapons. Fitz is, Fitz is playing well, uh, getting them to Does Tua get on the field? I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I don't Fitz think Fitz is so. like – foot. I, if, I'd be so pumped if I was a Miami fan. One, yeah. you're like getting to enjoy the games way earlier than you thought you would, and you haven't had to rush Tua out there. Like Fitz looks, yeah, Fitz looks good. Like legitimately, yeah. like you watch a game, and if you didn't like see the side profile of his beard coming out, you'd be like, "Yo, that's like a that's a really good quarterback, right?" You Lamar Jackson. So like, I haven't seen a Harvard yeah. grad not care about their brain as much as Ryan Fitzpatrick doesn't care. About it. <laughs> like I cannot slide. He goes head first every single time. I love watching Fitz play, dude. He's uh, like probably low key like one of the favorite players in the NFL, I think amongst like all fans collectively. So yeah, the Miami offense was absolutely, I think this goes, I think Brian Flores is like the real deal as a coach, man. He is, uh, someone had a, a good tweet and I'm trying to remember what it was about Miami, but it was just like the telltale sign of good coaching is like how Miami goes out there every single week and competes like to the last fucking whistle against yep. good opponents, bad opponent uh, opponents. Like you could tell they're energized to be out there regardless of whether or not they're supposed to get their asses kicked. And I feel like, that turnaround that Miami did and is in the process of doing is fucking legit. And they're going to be yeah. a really, really good team. So the offense was buzzing. Miles Gaskins looks like a, you know, a legit, like running back two for your fantasy squad on the flip side. I don't know. We're hearing a lot of reports about the ankle and like, I, I think they benched him because of the performance, but I think the performance might have been ankle related. Like, I don't think he was really able to step back on his foot and uh, really get into the groove of things with Jimmy G. But then again, I don't know. Is Jimmy G really even a good quarterback to begin with? I don't think he's a good quarterback, but he's a 
above replacement level quarterback. He's I mean, better he's than what he showed on. He's better than what he showed <laughs> yeah. on Sunday. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, but the, the point about Miami is interesting, really. We talked about this. I think we were like during the live stream when we were all dying on the draft. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm like starting to really like this Miami team. I'm liking what they're doing. Like they, they didn't blow yeah. a pick on a running back. You know, they, they built that offensive line. They're letting Tua learn underneath uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick and, you know, for all the shit we throw on Ryan Fitzpatrick, there's lots of stuff that goes on behind the scenes of learning the business of the NFL, like learn how to become a pro. Like Ryan Fitzpatrick definitely has that, right? He's jumped from team to team and he's been a pro uh, in the league. And he's a, he's a top 10 quarterback right now. Yeah, I might, and, I might grab a Fitz fucking Miami jersey right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm hyped up about Fitz. It's so fun watching him play. And like he's got so much zip on the ball too, man. It yeah, he's really, a gunslinger. Really, yeah, it really feels like he, he's gotten more accurate. He's aged like fucking wine, man. It makes yep. no sense. The other good thing, too, uh, is like when you're deciding between him or another quarterback to stream and you look at his matchup, you're like, well, that's a revenge game because he's played on every fucking team in the NFL. <laughs> yeah. have that factor every week. It also yeah. just feels like, I don't know, if it's like matchups don't matter, like he'll go out like a, <laughs> a fucking 400 spot on the San Francisco 49ers <laughs> and then he'll like against the Jaguars, he'll put up like 100 yards. So it's yeah. just like, I don't know. It's random. Fitz is, Fitz is the GOAT. And uh, Preston Williams, good to see him in biking, doing, doing a few things. I mean, had the ACL tear like relatively midway through last year. And then we felt really good about him during the summer and thought he was good. You know, the reports all said he was back to 100%. Maybe that's the slow start to it. I'm not really sure what's going on with Preston Williams, but um, after the big game, I mean, the way Fitzpatrick is playing, he's definitely worth a pickup in redraft leagues, I think. Yeah. He's been 100%. looking his way in the red zone and the end zone. He just hasn't really caught much. I know in a few two point conversions they went for, they looked his way early and often, but he's being used deep down the field yesterday and he looked like his old self. He's, he's basically just the Southern version of Auden Tate. They just throw it deep down the field. He toe taps and he falls down. Nah, yeah. Press, he, he's always fair. been, he's always been the, the more red zone guy. Like he's been, he's been better in the red zone than Parker, even going back to last year, Parker just gets more volume. So that's why you kind of want him. But yeah, in the red zone, Preston is always one of uh, Fitz's first looks. And, you know, I remember like Nick said he was talented coming out of college, like from way, way, way early on. So it's good to see him getting it on, but look, the next upset, I mean, I didn't see this coming. I don't know if any of y'all saw this coming, but, the Oakland Raiders Bro. went in to Chiefs Kingdom. I love the Raiders. And put a fucking beating on them. And they came out 40 to 32. Um, and makes it makes it feel like a lot closer than 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 the game was because they were honestly pretty dominant uh throughout most of the game. Uh Josh Jacobs had a decent day on the ground, uh, but not that many yards. Why? Because Derek Carr was slinging it like like Fitz magic, man. He was slinging it to Henry Ruggs. He was slinging it to fucking Nelson Aguilar. Didn't matter who was down there, but he was slinging it bombs and bombs downhill, just going toe to toe with the goat, uh, Patrick Mahomes. And that was, that was impressive, man. That was impressive to see them come out and get that big W uh, for the team. I don't know what you guys think about it from a fantasy perspective. I mean, it doesn't really change my perspective on much, uh, but it was just a really impressive game to watch to see them squeeze out that win. Bro, we, I mean, like we talked about it all off season after the draft happened and we're like, what are the Raiders doing? They're loading up to try to compete with the chiefs. And when Ruggs is on the field, this offense just operates on a different level. And uh, I, I also felt like they just dominated the battle in the trenches on both oh, yeah. sides of the ball. Like Mahomes had guys in his face the whole time. You usually, you usually don't see that on Mahomes' side of the ball. And he looked a little bit sloppy in this game. Carr was fucking lights out. And when Ruggs is on the field again, it just opens uh, a lot of things up. So the Raiders were a team that I really like because they're going to the third year with Gruden and they took a huge step forward offensively from the first to the second year. And it was something that I, you know, I imagine continued, but like, let's talk about these two running backs, man, because after week one, I have, I have a league, a redraft league where my RB one is Clyde. My RB two is Josh Jacobs. After week one, I was like, there's no way I'm not, you know, a top two team in the league right now. And those two have, pretty wildly disappointed since then is nothing more than like RB twos in your lineups. They're getting the volume, but like at what point do we start, you know, factoring that into what we think is going to happen going forward? I mean, Josh Jacobs, I think they're just going to ride him until he dies. Clyde, they're using in a little bit more of a strategic approach, but these running backs are just very highly coveted. Like, are you worried about either of them? Are you looking to sell either of them? Like what, what are your takes on these guys? I think the selling point for Clyde Edward to and you brought it up a ton in the off season, Nick is, when you have a running back on the Chiefs, they're scoring, what was it, like 1.7 touchdowns a game? He just can't find his way into the end zone. He's being used decently yeah. in the passing game. The running the running game volume isn't quite there uh, week after week consistently. But I'm a little bit nervous about him. This was supposed to be the blow-up spot because the Raiders were the worst run defense in terms of points per game allowed to the position. 
uh, heading into the week. It was either them or Carolina. Both of them stink. And he just really didn't show much at all. I know he had a touchdown callback by penalties. So maybe you want to buy low based off that. But uh, as you were saying, he's more of like a high-end running back two, low-end RB1. And I guess beggars can't be choosers because there's not a whole lot of options to pick from at the running back position. Um, but I know we had this debate earlier this offseason or early this season about dynasty. Who'd you rather have, Jonathan Taylor or Clyde edwards Hilaire? But I think the disparity has kind of closed in terms of redraft as well. Because Jonathan Taylor, he looked bad previously. This past week, he looked pretty good against a solid enough uh, Cleveland front seven. And they have a really easy schedule coming up. So not to take away from the question you just posed, but I just think that like Jonathan Taylor would be a good buy low uh, in turn for Clyde edwards Hilaire just because it's a good offense, but he's just not doing anything with it. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan Taylor is still my running back one um, in the rookie class. You guys, uh, we just got to still be a little bit more patient with a couple of these guys, I think. Like Clyde edwards Lair, he got a, he actually got a target and a catch and a receiving touchdown, got called back because of fucking holding or something like that. Um, th- look, there's no greater buzzkill than fucking holding and offensive penalties. Man. Dude, like, so I, I lost, I lost so much money on that Daniel Jones and uh, Darius Slayton uh, TD getting called back. Like that in my lineups. It's fucking tilting, but I'm not. I'm not that worried because he's still getting the opportunity, and Clyde still looks pretty good. Um, at least when he runs the ball, when he when he's catching it, um, it's like it's like one of those weird games. Um, he's just so, not. Yeah. He doesn't have like breakaway plays really, and yeah. I don't know if that was ever going to be in his real repertoire in the NFL. And like that's where you kind of gauge what he brings to the field via the combine because you could tell how fast yeah. or how you know his long speed relative to athletes, and that was yeah. I guess one of the concerns. And now. Like, Mahomes also just like a slinger, too. He's not someone who, like, drops back and is like, let me make the safe play. Let me dump it off to my running back. His first four fucking reads are Hail Mary 1, Hail Mary 2, <laughs> Travis Kelsey, Hail Mary 3, dump off. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. going to play a factor when you're the running back there. But um, it's kind of unfortunate to see. It's pretty, it's pretty shitty. And Josh Jacobs, like, Josh Jacobs is – I mean, he's getting more volume in the passing game, but – it's kind of what we brought up with Joe Mixon where it's not necessarily like valuable volume. He'll get like three receptions for 17 yards or something like that. You'd yeah. like to see him mixed in a little bit more like creatively in the passing game, like use that fucking Madden route that like works every single time where it's just like a little a angle. Triangle out of the, yeah. The angle coverable because the linebacker just runs really fast at him. And then before you know it, he's they're running opposite fucking ways. They need to get him more involved that way. But like, also, who the fuck am I to say that? Because the Raiders are fucking rolling right now. And uh, I'd be worried about Josh Jacobs. I think I'd be less worried about Jacobs than I would be Clyde. Yeah, me too. I mean, 20-year-old, uh, I guess 22 now, running back, you know, produced at a pretty high level in his first year. And look, you're just not going to get like RB1 upside with Josh Jacobs. You should to be okay with that. Um, and he's gonna, but he's a guy that dominates all goal line carries, right? So he doesn't have that problem. Um, and he's going to be like maybe like a 40 to 50 like target type guy. And, and you're just banking on yardage and touchdowns. And that's okay. He looked, not everyone's Mike Davis, man. Like Mike Davis, God is, there's only one of him for a reason. Um, not everyone's going to be like him. So everyone wants to be like Mike, but not everyone's going to be like Mike. So that, Wait, are, that, are they, are we doing like a, are, are they doing a little like, um, holding off C-Mac right now because Mike Davis is so hot. Do you think they're? I mean, there's no reason to rush them back, right? They're three and out. I think I think C Max healthy, bro. I think they're doing a tie rod where it's like we'll get him back out there when he's a (laughs) hundred percent. It's a win win. Mike Davis is a beast, and I'm sure CMC wants to stay at home with Olivia Culpo. So like, (laughs) (laughs) look, CMC is a system quarterback. We've said that all along, and Mike Davis has proven that out. So Mike Davis is a god. As long as he wants to stay in there, I'm cool with it. Um, I got handcuffed. Uh, I actually have him in a couple of leagues, so he's he's riding out for me pretty well right now. Um, doesn't help me in the fucking BDG dynasty where I was trying to go for a three P. I lost to fucking Brandon Wright today, and he's like a tanking team. That's like wait, what? Four. You took he an L from blew, him? He blew me out, man. I like, barely ever he, look at that league. He, he started fucking Chase Claypool and just destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Wait, Mike. Oh no, never mind. I got like multiple guys going. Yeah, he chased. He started Chase Claypool and just fucking destroyed me. Um, wow, that's in. Uh, that's actually hilarious. I didn't realize yeah. that. I, I thought you were still like dominating the entire no. league, but I guess no. Like, I mean, I, don't, I lost Michael Thomas and I lost him. See, I'm just sitting there pulling my thumbs right now. Uh, hopefully, I squeak into the playoffs, but we'll see. But yeah, so that's that's that game. I think you know. I don't know if there's any other games you guys want to talk, talk about. Talk about Kenyon Drake just still not being good at like anything. I don't want to talk about Kenyon Drake. I'm done with Kenyon Drake. This guy is just like not doing anything. I mean, Chase Edmonds looked objectively better at every stage of the game. Uh, I I mean, even even as someone that has Drake in a couple of leagues, like I'm hoping they just move on and just start 
start funneling more Scott passes. pulled off a fucking Drake for Devin Singletary trade like oh, wow. four days ago. I'm like, wow. the fact that you got anything of, yeah, like a five year gap difference, like, it, it, I like fucking pretty Richie, bro. Like, what are you doing, <laughs> man, my friend? Well, he was How unwavering when he did it, though. Unwavering, like he had no fucking fucks given about. Dude, his I mean, Scott also got like he got Nick Chubb in, in our league, and he gave up like Mark Ingram and like T.Y. Hilton and like some other trash. Um, and he's like, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, piece, like well, thank guy... you. I sent you a trade. Thank you. Yeah. Please check. Hopefully, yeah. your family as well. Accept. <laughs> it's like you just need yeah. that from Scott. This is like. <laughs> And in the chat, he's like, well, this guy got, you know, three or four starters. I'm like, dude, who's starting T.Y. Hilton and Mark Ingram? So they're like, like fucking RB70 and like wide receiver. Eight. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's fucking starting. No, it's funny. Right like, that's not even an exaggeration. Like Mark Ingram and T.Y. Hilton, you know, like wide receiver 64. <laughs> they're shit. literally not startable right now. Nick, how um, quickly after he got Kenyon or Ken Drake, did he rename him on Sleeper to like Hotline Bling or something like that? Because Richie's always come with the nicknames like two seconds after. He oh, yeah, that. dude, Richie's nicknames were the best, man. We, uh, we, that league's on flea flicker richie oh. is it's so funny because that that league's group chat is wildly active it's 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 like by far and away the funnest league that i'm in and we're just talking 24 7 about fucking random bullshit and richie never pops in every like five to seven days a uh, five to seven business days he'll pop in and we'll just go crazy like send pictures of like black asses and like be like <laughs> lmfao that trade was ridiculous it was like a trade that happened like a week, a week prior or something we're like richie what have you been talking about so i tag him all the time i'm just like i'm just like i'm gonna kill you richie at richie because i know he won't fucking like, see it for like two weeks he doesn't know how to tag um, it anyways like he'll write at noah but it's not like in black it's just he wrote at noah and he didn't like actually click the tag and one time he's like i've been eating AT. too much black ass i need to get tested for covid <laughs> yeah he always be sending those pictures i'm like Richie, ain't you married with like fucking six kids or something <laughs> um i guess do we need i guess the one last game we probably cover a little bit is uh viking seahawks on night no. football uh let's just cover a little bit because dalvin cook got groin injury so that's that's got downfield implications alexander madison looked good except for when he pulled the trend richardson on fourth and one just fucking ran to the back of his own lineman the of the first down. yeah we call, call, yeah the josh kelly uh what do you guys uh, oh and obviously you know russell wilson did russell wilson thing uh at the end and, and threw to dk metcalf dk metcalf shout out to uh russell j clay over on twitter he i think he's one of the first guys that had dk metcalf as a wide receiver one hey ball blast so, him you don't forget that oh yeah because of the contract yo shout out to ball blast him also at dk as a wide receiver one uh i look man dk is awesome and he's been he's been balling out and the, the key fear is he's he's tied to russell wilson i think the lesson to be learned at least for me I was out on DK as a prospect uh, because I felt like he was like, you know, more of like a one trick pony. Uh, turns out that being a one trick pony doesn't fucking matter if you're really elite at that one trick and you pair with someone that's willing to use, utilize and elevate you on that thing. So DK Metcalf, baller. Russ I think it was just telling that he dropped like three passes on the final drive and they still yeah, just and went, he still went back to him. Time. That last yeah. catch was insane. Just the fact that Russ just chucks it up. Like you, it's so fucked up that like they can get the ball on the four yard line. And with like go. a minute left and you're just like 92 percent chance they finish that, yeah. that they fucking win this game <laughs> yeah it's ridiculous it, so that game was crazy insane. uh dk is officially my my one right now in dynasty i moved him up he's 22 fucking years old tied to russell wilson like i can't yeah. make an argument against him russ loves him bro it's yeah downfield it's, it's like he he is he is basically uh just running he is michael gallup in the seattle offense and yeah. Tyler Lockett is just running like that. He just goes yeah. up and goes like that every time, exactly. every single fucking time. And DK's downfield all over the place. So I, he's looking like a fucking beast. Chris Carson's getting involved in the passing game uh, on the Viking side of things. <laughs> I think Chris Carson at one point had four catches for six yards. I was like, that is the most Chris Carson receiving stat That's line. That's exactly ever. Good point. <laughs> so much. Zach so much. fucking stinks. Uh, but yeah, DK so elite. Uh, I'm 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 so glad that I just like ate that L real quick and just like went on a total DK buying spree this offseason because I think he's gonna be he's gonna be the next big thing. And uh you love to see it. Love to see it with Russ. Uh on the other side, you know, we talked about this last week and you know, I remember telling you not to worry about Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen went out there and just did Adam Thielen Thielen things and just balled out, uh put put fucking defenders on skates. Look, they their schedule is a tough one. There's gonna be a lot of scoring. I think Adam Thielen's gonna be a locked in wide receiver once. Just keep riding him uh going into the stretch. I think he's still the guy to have in season long over Justin Jefferson. But obviously Dynasty, you want Justin Jefferson because he's, he's out there making plays. But I love that yeah, I was yeah. like I'm thinking about moving Adam Thielen and then like the next game 
eight for 114 touchdown next game <laughs> nine for 82 touchdowns i'm like jesus christ i'm so fucking bad at this <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous like the amount of moves that i want to make on like an hourly basis my literally the way i think about a player changes probably like within the hour it's fucking insane yeah yeah i'm back uh, that's all we got man, back have we know. been right about like anything this year at all i said uh, guys i said that's all we got let's not keep going my, my original <laughs> thing i love that i'm feeling he was like my wide receiver five going into drafts then I drafted him, and I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't do that. And then he has a big game, and I'm like, yes. And he has a bad game, and I'm like, no. You know, it's just fucking – I'm done. I'm done. We're done. We're fucking done. Are you guys done? My ass is sticking to the chair. Yeah, we're fucking done. Nah, I'm not we're even wearing pants, so. <laughs> really? Because you're watching Herbert. That's why he's stuck to the chair. <laughs> Love that. All right. That's all we got for you all today. If you enjoyed the video, the film, the featured film, Oscar Worthy, click the button that looks like that. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to their channel. We'll be linked in the description. Anything else? That's it, man. All right, you're fired.